Most people know something about the story of David. He was a shepherd boy, a poet, a great friend, and became a mighty king of Israel. David also had this incredibly close relationship with God. And his faith was so great that God called David a man after his own heart. But when we look at David's life, we also see flaws, big flaws. David was more like us than we tend to think. And his story is a lot like our own. A perfect God loving an imperfect person. This is the life of David. Today we're continuing, as you just saw in our sermon series, Faith and Flaws, and today is extremely practical. Every one of us in this room have wrestled with the will of God. How do I know God's will? How can I figure that out? Uh, some of you are at a crossroads in your life right now, and you're, you have multiple options before you, and you're trying to figure out, all right, Lord, what is your plan? What is your will for my life? And what I love about the Word of God I love the Word of God because here we're studying King David who lived 3,000 years ago. We're reading ancient texts from 3,000 years ago, but everything we're studying is applicable to 2019. It makes sense for us today. And so today I want to talk to you about how to align with the will of God. How do I do that? What needs to happen in my life so that I can be in alignment with God's will and how do I take the necessary steps to make that happen? Now, as you're making your way to 2 Samuel, I want to give you a little background of where we are now. We've been in 1 Samuel, but now we're turning the page to 2 Samuel. I invite you to join me in 2 Samuel chapter 7. And as you're turning there, I want you to know what's happened. We've talked about Shepherd David for quite a while now. And now we're going to start talking about King David because in 2 Samuel chapter 5, David officially becomes king. Saul has died. King Saul has died at the end of 1 Samuel. Uh, in the first part of 2 Samuel, David mourns the death of, of Saul and also his best friend Jonathan. He mourns that. And then we see the process of him becoming king in chapter 5. And then um, now he is king and he comes up with this great idea. This is what we're about to read about. He comes up with this idea that now that the Israelites are being established in Jerusalem and now that the city of David has been established and he now has a palace there that he rules in, uh, in the city of David. Uh, those of us that were just in Israel and those of you going to Israel with us, we stood there just not long ago in the city of David. And uh, this is what we're reading about today. And Basically, what happened is David said, since I have a permanent home, I want God to have a permanent home. And so David says, I've got this great idea. I want to build a temple. So that was his idea. But we're going to journey through this today and discover that that was not in God's plan for David. So follow along with me. 2 Samuel chapter 7. Now, when the king lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies... The king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the Lord dwells in a tent, referring to the presence of God being represented in the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was kept under a tent. So David's sitting in his den or living room or whatever you have in a palace, and he's sitting back kind of scratching his head saying, Hmm, look at this beautiful cedar that I have in my house. Look at how opulent my house is. And the Lord... The symbol of his dwelling place is a tent. So then, he, th then Nathan speaks up. By the way, this is the first time in Scripture we're introduced to Nathan. Nathan is a prophet. Nathan becomes the spiritual advisor for David, kind of a national spiritual advisor, kind of like years ago what Billy Graham may have done with, with presidents and things like that, just giving spiritual wisdom and spiritual advice. And it says in uh, verse 3, And Nathan said to the king, Go and do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. Now, first alignment principle I want you to recognize is the alignment principle of reflecting. Here's the deal. Sometimes we get ideas in our head, and we get these, these thoughts in our head, 
and we don't discern the will of God without proper reflection. Now, I want you to notice something very significant in chapter 7, verse 1. Now, when the king lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies. Now, that is a significant phrase because I want to give you the timeline. David was 20 years old when he killed Goliath. Now, remember, David lived in obscurity. David lived as a shepherd that no one recognized. Even when the prophet Samuel came to find at Jesse's house, who would eventually be anointed king, remember David was way down the line. They paraded all the other brothers through, and Samuel says, is there anybody else? And the dad, Jesse, says, oh yeah, the youngest, smells like sheep, out with sheep, but I guess I'll bring him in. So out of obscurity, he's brought into the limelight. He's in the spotlight in particular after he kills Goliath, and David becomes more popular than the king. Remember that? And so now David's more popular than the king, but the problem with this is, is Saul hates it. And so then for 10 years, 20 years old when he kills Goliath, he does not become king till he's 30. We learn that in um, chapter 5 of 2 Samuel, that he becomes king at age 30. So for 10 years, he's running, he's hiding, he's fighting enemies. His life is tumultuous for a decade. And what's so significant is now the Scripture says God gave him rest. Interesting. Isn't it interesting when we slow down to reflect that we start thinking of things a little bit differently? We start thinking of other things. And so it's in this moment of stillness that David comes up with the idea, I should build a temple. I've got a house. God doesn't have a house. I should build one. Then the yes man, Nathan, says in verse 3, good idea, king. I like it. <laughs> and he says, go forth and do it. Great idea. I think you should go forth and do it. Well, that's kind of how things are left until verse 4. Look at this. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Now, I find this fascinating. David is thinking up ideas of the way that he can serve God, and he's got the right heart. He wants a place for Israel to worship, and so that's a, that's a noble thing. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a, it's, the, it's a right motive, and it's a right thing that he's thinking through. But now, at nighttime, when Nathan should have been at rest, and Nathan's reflecting over what he just said, God speaks to Nathan. This is what's said in verse 5. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all the places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? So God says, look, great idea, not my plan. You made that up. That's not what I'm asking for. One of the things we have to all accept if we're going to really understand God's will is we have to slow down enough to really listen, is this of God or is this not of God? It's one of the reasons we've gone through the process that we've gone through with this strategic growth team. I started talking to the executive committee this time last year about the growth that we were having in modern worship. And so instead of jumping to conclusions and jumping to a decision, we went through an eight-month process where we prayed, where we sought God, where we were open to any solution that we will share with you at these meetings, that we were open to any possible solution that God had until he revealed to us the proposal that we want to bring to you. And so there has to be a moment where you say, I'm going to pause, I'm going to rest, I'm going to reflect. It's fascinating to me that in Genesis chapter 1, God created the earth and created everything in it in six days. And Scripture tells us on the seventh day, God rested. Well, oftentimes that becomes a big theological debate. Well, does that mean that God gets tired? Did Almighty God, who has all the power, did He rest because He got tired and needed a siesta? No, the word rest means, the word rest means that he 
reflected. That's what Sabbath means. Why do we need Sabbath? Because we need a time to reflect. Too many of us are not hearing from God because we're too busy. We're not hearing from God because we don't reflect. We come up with some idea and say, this is a great idea. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do for God. But is God in it? And many of our good ideas are not God's idea. It's not what God wants. And so if we're going to be in the will of God, we have to slow down to reflect. We need some margin in our life. Do you know when you do a research paper on an 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper, Most of the time you're required to have one-inch margins and a research paper or a piece of paper with uh, with those type margins, with a one-inch margin, do you realize that over 37% of the page is blank? And even more interesting, if you double space it, instead of single space, if you double space, which is what most research papers are, if you double space it, over half of every page is blank. Over half of the page is blank. Is blank. Now, why does that matter? When you read something, you have to have margin to be able to understand it. If you went and read a piece of paper and there were words all the way to the margins and there were no indentions and no paragraphs and it was just words after words after words, our brain can't process all that. And that's why in publications there's margins, there's space, there's rooms, there's gaps because our mind has to rest when we read. Your life requires margin if you're going to hear from God. And too many of us are missing the will of God because we're not reflecting. Second alignment principle is the principle of release. David had a vision. David had a good idea, but it was not God's idea. And so God starts walking David through this process of release. First thing David had to accept to release was to accept his role. You're going to have to accept your role. Look at verse 8. Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture to fall, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. Now, this is significant because what God is doing is God is defining David's role. This is known as the beginning. This chapter is the Davidic covenant where God's saying, I'm making a covenant with you, David, of what I'm going to do in your life. But you need to understand what your role is. And your role is is that you're going to shepherd my people. And it's fascinating to me. He says, you're going to shepherd my people. Some of your translations say ruler and some of your translations say prince. But it does not say you're going to shepherd my people as a king and here's why it's fascinating God didn't say all right David you're going to shepherd my people as king he said no you're going to shepherd my people as a prince or a ruler the reason why that's significant is prince or ruler means manager it means that you're submitted to somebody else and what God is saying is that you are simply the prince I am king of kings So God's telling him, if you're going to release, you have to release your role to me, the part that you're going to play. And God's telling David, I want you to shepherd my people. I want you to lead my people. I want you to rule over my people as you submit under me. But one thing I'm not asking you to do is to be a builder. I'm not asking you to do that. It's not your role. Friday, I was thinking through my breakfast. My breakfast consisted of instant oatmeal because I'm too lazy to cook the stuff on the stovetop. So I put instant oatmeal in the microwave. I had scrambled eggs, which were on the stovetop. I had a piece of toast, which came out of the toaster. And I got the juice and the butter and the eggs out of the refrigerator. So my breakfast on Friday morning took four appliances. Refrigerator, toaster, microwave, stovetop. Four things. And each one of those appliances had a specific role. I put bread in the toaster. I did not try to toast bread in the microwave. I didn't try that. It wasn't going to work. I didn't try to scramble eggs in the toaster. It wasn't going to work. I didn't try to make oatmeal in the refrigerator. I didn't try to cool down my juice on the stovetop. Why? 
Because every one of those appliances had a very specific role, but they had one thing in common. They were all plugged into the same power source. It's the only thing they had in common. Different roles, same power source. This is how we must live in God's will. We must accept that we all have a different role. Your role's different from mine. My role's different from yours. But each one of us have a part that we play in. When you want to start living out faith, you know you're living out faith when you found your role in your sweet spot. And so God is asking of David, you need to find your spot and accept your role. So some of you are going to have to release a dream of doing something you're not designed to do. I will never be modern worship leader. I don't sing. Doesn't matter if I dream about it. Doesn't matter if I pretend that I want to dream about it. It's just not going to be a role that I'm going to play. Not my role. Can't do it. Now, you want me to preach? I can do that. (laughs) I'm kind of a one-trick pony. That's about it right there, all right? So uh, I can do that. Second thing that David had to do was accept that you're going to have to do as well is accept that someone else may complete it. Now, it's not that anything was wrong with building the temple, but look with me in verse 12, starting in verse 12 of chapter 7. David says, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, that's a euphemism for when you get buried, when you're dead and gone, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men and with stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In other words, what God is saying is you're not going to be the one to build the temple, but one of your offspring will. Now, you want to talk about releasing something. Some of you are holding on to things. Number one, you're holding on to dreams that aren't going to come true or you're holding on to things that you would like to do that you're not designed to do because it's not your role to do it. And so some of you are wrestling with God over that. But some of you are wrestling with God that if I let this thing go in my life, what if someone else picks it up and completes it? Well, that might very well be God's will. And I believe some of us are exhausted spiritually because we're trying to do things and accomplish things and you're frustrated because you're trying to accomplish something God never asked you to do. But yet you've made up in your mind that you're supposed to do it. That's where we've got to understand and accept our role. We've got to understand and accept that someone else may complete it. And third, we must accept that God's plans are bigger. So here's David sitting in his house of cedar, and he's sitting in that house, scratching his head, saying, ah, this is a great idea. I've got a nice house. God lives in tent. I'm going to build a great temple for him. Great idea. And God says to to David, that's a temporal thing. That's temporary. Actually, if you go to Israel today, you'll see the temple mount, but the temple's been torn down twice. So there is no temple right now. It's been destroyed. It's been torn down. You see the foundation of it, but you see no temple. And so David's vision was temporary. David's vision was for a moment in time. David's vision was when David saw temporary, God saw eternal. So we have to come to a point in our life where we say, Lord, am I in this for what I want or am I in this for your plan and what you have in mind and what you will because your plans are bigger. I love how uh, Paul put it in Ephesians chapter 3 starting in verse 20 where Paul wrote, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we could all ever ask or imagine according to his power that's at work within us, To him be the glory in the church and throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. 
Now to him, not to us, but now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine. Here's what I want you to understand about the will of God. Whatever you're trying to think up, God's got bigger plans. I think often about Rivland Hills Baptist Church. <clears throat> we talked about this during the 50th anniversary that was just a few months ago. 50 years ago, there was a group of people sitting in Irmo High School group of about 36 people sitting in Irmo High School saying, we believe God's called us to start a church, and that's where we started. I wonder if 50 years ago they would have ever sat there and imagined that in 2019 our averages on Sunday morning would be 2,100 to 2,200 people in worship. Could they have ever thought that? They were just being faithful at that moment to say, we're going to be obedient to what God's called us to do right now. And we're going to be faithful to that. And we're going to be obedient to that and what God's asked of us. And look at what God's done. It's more than anybody could imagine. And I'm here to tell you, based on the work and move of God at this very moment in the life of Rivlin Hills, we haven't scratched the surface yet. God's at work. And God's moving. And God has bigger plans for us. But for us to get there and to be in alignment with His will, we must reflect we must be willing to release. And the third alignment principle is the principle of responding. We must respond. Now here's what's interesting. David responds to God starting in verse 18 in a prayer. This is a wonderful prayer. I love studying prayers in Scripture. But the remainder of this chapter is a chapter on, of David's prayer. Now, God has just told David, no. <laughs> David wants to build a temple. God says, no, that's the answer. So then what's our response? Because you've had moments in your life where God's told you no. You've wrestled with moments in your life where you thought you were going to go one direction and God said no and pulled you another direction. And you scratch your head and say, God, what are you doing? What do you mean no? And then we have to come to the point where we respond. And oftentimes we respond in anger. We respond shaking our fist. Sometimes we respond in disobedience. Study the Old Testament. The Israelites had plenty of moments they responded with disobedience. David. He's at a moment right now where he's responding well, but David had many moments where he responds not so well. But we all have some type of response. Look at David's response. First, David's response was gratitude. God says no. David thanks God. Look at verse 18. Then King David went and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Lord, and what is my house that you have brought me thus far? And yet, this was a small thing in your eyes, O Lord. You have spoken also of your servant's house for a great while to come. And this is instruction for mankind, O Lord God. And what more can David say to you? For you know your servant, O Lord God. By the way, as I read this, listen to the repetition, the word servant and the phrase, O Lord God. Hang on to that. I'll talk about it in just a moment. Because of your promise, verse 21, and according to your own heart, you have brought about all this greatness to make your servant know it. Therefore, you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you and there is no God beside you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. So David's first response when he's disappointed. I mean, this is an answer of disappointment. No. And what is his response? I'm going to thank God. I'm going to show God gratitude. Theologian A.T. Pearson said this, disappointments are God's appointments. You hear that? Disappointments are God's appointments. In my journey, I've had moments as I sought God's will that I was sure that I knew that I was supposed to be in a different type of ministry or a different location or a different place. And I thought I knew exactly what I needed for myself. And there's many times God said, no, it's not where you're supposed to be, no. And I am so thankful that God said no, and I'll tell you why. 
because God has given me the unbelievable privilege of pastoring Rivland Hills Baptist Church. And I love this place. And I love it here. And God has called me here. And this is where God wants me to serve. But for, to get to the yes, God had to say no. Did I like the no? No. Nobody likes the no. Because I thought I knew what was right. Because I thought I knew what God's plan was supposed to be. God, I've got this figured out. Let's go this direction. God says, "Uh uh-uh. This is it. We must learn, first of all, to respond with gratitude. Secondly, we must learn to respond with praise. Praise reminds you that God's in control. Praise reminds you that your focus is supposed to be on God. Look at verse 26. And your name will be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts is God over Israel, and the house of your servant David will be established before you. We must praise God for who he is and strive after God and God alone. Some of you may listen to Pastor Tony Evans. He's pastor of Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship in Dallas, Texas. I love listening to Dr. Evans preach. And he tells a story when his kids were younger. He's been a popular pastor and he's traveled a lot. And so he tells a story about times when he would come back from traveling and he had the habit of whatever city he went to that he would get some souvenir or trinket for his kids and then bring that home to his kids when they were younger. Some of you have done that, that travel or business or go on some trip. And and so his kids got in the habit that when daddy came home, he had a trinket. And so they would get so excited when daddy came to the front door because he'd hand out the trinkets. Well, he got tired of that and wondered. He said, I wonder if my kids are just excited about me coming home because uh, I brought stuff. So one time, Dr. Evans decided not to bring stuff. And so he goes to the front door and the kids come and they're like, where's my stuff? What'd you get me? What'd you get me? What'd you get me? He said, I didn't get you anything. Oh, Dad. And they kind of walked off and walked away. You can imagine young kids with that type of reaction. Well, Dr. Evans goes on and says this. He said, my kids were so into the blessings that they lost sight of the blesser. And as long as the blesser brought back a blessing, they were fine. A lot of folks want to come to church and don't want to mess with the blesser. They just want the blesser to leave behind a blessing. We really know we're aligning with the will of God when we love God as the blesser and not for his blessings. It's a mark of living faith. It's a mark of aligning with the will of God. God, I love you because you're the blesser. I love you because you're in control. I love you because you know what I can't see. I love you because you have every aspect of my life in your hands. Not that, Lord, I love you because I just got something new in my driveway or more square footage on my house or that boat. Thank you, Lord. I finally got that. That's not the reasons to praise God. We praise Him because of who He is. In other words, our bottom line call is to make a bigger deal out of God than we do out of us. How do we do that? It brings us to our third response. And David's third response was a response of humility. He responded with gratitude. He responded with praise. And thirdly, he responded with humility. Did did you notice as I was reading, I told you to pay attention to the word servant. In this prayer, the word servant is used ten times. And in this prayer, the word Adonai translated, O Lord God, it's the Hebrew word Adonai. Adonai is the biblical word for master. This is very significant because in David's prayer, he's saying, I am the servant and you are, O Lord God, you are master. So what he's doing is he's putting everybody in their proper place. Basically what he's saying is he's saying, wow is God and woe is me. And you want to talk about what humility is? I like to define humility as wow is God and woe is me. Wow, God. You are in control. Wow, God, you do understand the pieces of the puzzle that I don't get. 
you understand that. So my response is, you are master, and I am servant. And I want to align with that every single day. I don't want to miss that. I want to be humble before you because you're in absolute control. Tim Keller describes the spiritual life as a spiritual cyclone. He talks about the cycles of the spiritual life that he says, if you've ever watched these, this video footage of tornado chasers in Oklahoma, uh, you'll see that a, a cyclone will come through and it'll pick up a truck or an automobile and it'll pick it up and pull it into the vortex and, and then it'll spit it back out. And our Tim Keller describes our spiritual life as much like that, that God pulls us in to be close to Him. He pulls us in to know more about Him. He pulls us in so we'll listen to Him. He pulls us in to show us His power. He pulls us in to show us His presence. He pulls us in so that we will know Him and only want Him. But He does it so that He can send us back out so that we can tell other people about his presence. So then once again, he can pull us back in and then he can send us back out and he can pull us back in and he can send us back out. And that's what God wants to do in our life. And the only way we can be aligned for that to happen is to take time to reflect. You must get margin in your life if you're going to know God's will. Second of all, we must release. I'm telling you, if you really take this message to heart, there'll be something you have to give up. There'll be something that God's going to say no to, no to. And I want to tell you something. No in God's will is a good thing. It is a really good thing. And so there's some things that God's going to want you to say no to. There's some things God's going to challenge you to release. And if we're going to be in alignment with God's will, <clears throat> we've got to have the proper response. David's response was gratitude, praise, and humility. And I cannot think of a better response as a church than saying, God, you're at work at Rivlin Hills. You're doing something that we want to be a part of. It's a movement that we want to be a part of. And our response to you is going to be, we release to you whatever your will is. We want that. We desire that as a church. And we are going to respond with gratitude and with praise and with humility. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I stand in all of you. I stand in all of your living, active word. I Stand amazed at the power of your word. We're reading 3,000-year-old text that has power for today. So, Father, thank you. And I pray that each one of us in this room would make the decision to either trust you as Lord and Savior or make the decision to follow you wholeheartedly, make a decision to release, to rededicate, to whatever it is we need to do, that we'd be bold and we'd make those decisions for you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.